Well, good morning, everyone. I see that we have uh, attendees logging on, so I'll just give everybody a few minutes to to get logged on. It's it's right here at nine thirty, and we'll just we'll get started in just a moment. We'll just give it just one more minute and then we'll get started right up. I thank everybody for being here this morning. All right. Well, we'll we'll get started now, and um, and then you know we'll let a few more people log on. But glad to see so many people have joined us this morning. Um, we are uh, excited about doing these webinars. I've been doing them now for several months. I I tell you, one of the one of the um, kind of things about these webinars is I started doing them at at the request of a friend or at the, the, the kind of urging of a friend, and and after I did a uh, or when I started doing them. Uh, it was a it was one of these situations where COVID had slowed things down. We weren't in trial yet. A lot of my cases were worked up. I had tons of time on my hand, and so what can I do with it? I'd I'd love to do a webinar and provide a free CLE, get an opportunity to talk a little bit about what I do and provide education for some folks that have uh, similar cases. And and here we are now. The court system's wide open, and uh, and I've got three cases set for trial real soon, and so. Um, we're we're full going here at Beasley Allen. I know that you all are seeing the same thing. I've got a trucking case that's set for trial uh, in September. I've got another trucking case set for trial in uh, in September, and then I've got a, a a really big automotive product liability case against Chrysler set for trial in October. And I'm excited about those. Um, I am full speed getting ready for those already. Uh, I know that with them being back to back, I need to get started early and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing so. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, a case that means a lot to me. Uh, it's a case that I tried several years ago. You'll see in, in the style of the case in a moment that it was filed back in 2009. Uh, the trial, I believe, may have been 2013 or 14, uh, but no, it would have been 12 or 13, but um, we'll get into that in a moment. I want to thank everybody again uh, for everyone that's attending. CLE credit will be provided. We'll, we will be uh, submitting those hours for you on your behalf. Thank you for registering. We are always uh, just so pleased to have you with us. Um, again, this is one of my favorite things I do each month is, is to talk about um, talk about what I do for, for a living. I'm, I'm really proud about what I do. I love my career. I love the cases that I've chosen to work on and um, or have kind of been chosen for me in, in some ways. But anyway, um, this was, a, again, this was a, a case that we did um, a few years ago. I'll tell you, it's, it was a unique case. Um, and I learned some lessons in it. I think I did some things right. I think uh, one of the things I hope to talk about with you today is probably some things I might do different 
if I were to try it again, you, you say, you know, what, why would you do something different if it, if you won? And I, and I said, well, you know, you know, I always get better. It's a, I always have learned more from the cases that I lost and we've all lost cases than the ones I've won, but uh, you know, that's my fault. Uh, there were things I could always do better in the cases I won. You just tend to not think about them as much because, well, you won. So uh, this was one that I won. And, and I'll tell you, the first lesson that comes out of this is, is it was a death case in Gwinnett County. Uh, I got a $4.6 million verdict for my client, but that's exactly what I asked for. And, um, and that, that, is that a good thing, a bad thing? I don't know. I, I think in light of what I know today, sitting here in 2021, I probably would have asked for more money. I probably would have uh, done a better job of, uh, of evaluating the case and asking for more money from the jury. Um, and, and so I think it, was, it, was, it may have been honestly worth more than $4.6 million. I don't know. Uh, you, you, you can't, it's hard to uh, Monday morning quarterback a win uh, if you ask for more, maybe they don't give it to you. Maybe they, maybe they turn against you. I don't know. Maybe it was the exact same number. But uh, regardless, I, I do worry about that. I, I think another thing that was unique about this case that really uh, was a little bit revolutionary for the time was that we had just gone through what nobody ever predicted. If you all remember, um, when the financial crisis hit our country and in 2007, eight, nine period, there was the automobile bailout. Well, several of the car companies declared bankruptcy, including uh, Chrysler. And because they had declared bankruptcy, there were a certain amount of cars that they just, they didn't assume liability for. And this was one of them. As a result of that, there were a number of law firms who had looked at working on this case and said, look, we cannot sue Chrysler for the defects in this Jeep and they passed on the case. I, I went forward and said, I think I can win against the component part manufacturer. There was a seatbelt manufacturer that had uh, made the seatbelt independent of Chrysler, supplied it to Chrysler. And, and therefore I thought I can sue them. They're not bankrupt. And, but yet there was an empty chair in the case and there was a big empty chair in the case but with Chrysler not being there. So that was a big, uh, that was a big issue for us in that case. Um, and that you'll see how that played into uh, their defense. The, the key safety systems was the name of the company that we were, um, that we were suing. They were the seatbelt manufacturers of that, uh, for, the, for the seatbelt. And again, the case, the case was pending in Gwinnett County. Judge South had it. She did an outstanding job. Um, but what I'm going to go through you today was my closing um, and how I, how I, and that kind of summarizes the case in a lot of ways. And, and it hit some of the high points. It certainly didn't hit everything, but this was my closing um, in, in order a little bit. It's not word for word. I'm not going to quote to you what I said, but I'm going to go through and take, talk to you why it was important. And also um, things I might've done different things I might've done right. Um, but again, this was a, the, and let me just kind of set up the scene for, for the case. So it was a Jeep rollover as a uh, Jeep Wrangler. The Jeep had a uh, uh, two women in it, a daughter and a mom. The daughter was 15 years old. She didn't have a driver's license yet. She had a learner's permit and she was working at a local Publix down the street. She had to go to work that day. So she asked her mom, can I drive to work? And um, you drop me off and then you drive the car back home. Mom agreed and was in the passenger seat. The daughter, the 15-year-old daughter, was driving. Probably because of her inexperience and youth, um, she, we don't exactly know why she lost control, but she did lose control. She uh, leaves the roadway to the left. She overcorrects back right, which is something I tell my children all the time. Do not do that and tell your kids and your family. Um, look, if you ever leave the roadway, come back on the road slowly. Don't jerk back on. But unfortunately, uh, this young girl did jerk back on the road. She panicked. That put her into a uh, into a driver's side leading um, y'all. She kind of corrected back to the to the left to correct that, and then now she's in a pasture side leading y'all, and she ends up rolling the vehicle over numerous times. In the process, her mom is ejected from the vehicle. 
Um, and she, she lives for a number of days or hours, excuse me, before she ultimately dies in hospital in Gwinnett. And so uh, they defended the case saying, first off, our seatbelt did not spool out. We, our allegation of defect in the case was that the seatbelt didn't lock or that it locked and came unlocked. And so we were, our allegation was it was on her type. She was wearing it correctly. The pastor, Miss Bruner, was wearing the seatbelt correctly. And because it failed, because it came unlocked, uh, it spooled out webbing um, several inches over a foot, actually, of webbing into the system, which loosened it and it allowed her to be thrown out of the car despite wearing her seatbelt. After the crash, you can see pictures of the vehicle with the buckle still buckled. The, the original um, kind of investigation by the police officer made them lead, led them to believe that the, the young lady, or the, the mom in the passenger seat was had buckled her belt and was sitting on it because she got ejected. How, how else could she be ejected with a seatbelt? if she had it on correctly. And so they thought she wasn't wearing it correctly. She was sitting on it and maybe buckled it so that the buzzer wouldn't go off or the, the light would turn off. Um, that wasn't the case. She was wearing it correctly. There was a police officer who did an, an amazing job. I mean, just, a, a, just an amazing job. He went back and he found her skin marks on the belt where she had come out from up under it. And he changed the report. This was before we were ever involved. To, to show that she was on the, uh, that she was wearing her seatbelt. And so they, they defended at first that, um, that it didn't spool out at all. And so you'll see that I addressed that in closing right off the bat. I had taken the corporate representative deposition of key safety systems early in the case. During the deposition, anticipating that they were gonna take that defense, uh, I asked their corporate representative some questions along the lines of should it ever happen that a person properly wearing their belt ever be ejected? You'll see what he says, but, um, uh, you know, essentially, uh, you know, the point I want to make is use your corporate rep depositions, try to anticipate their defenses, get their people to comment on them, and then you can use them in, in court. You can, the, you can use the corporate representative deposition for any purpose. I use them during opening. I use them during close um, and to remind the jury of the key points in the case. And so um, here is, uh, here is the corporate representative of, of the, um, do you uh, believe that a person can be ejected despite correctly wearing the seatbelt? Ejected? How do you mean? Completely ejected from the vehicle. And and what sort of scenario are you talking about? Roll over. I mean, you'd, you'd have to give me more information. I could envision a situation where someone's going 120 miles an hour and, and they're an extremely heavy person and maybe it rolled 12 times. I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's... Given your hypothetical, I, I guess I don't, I can't answer that question. So you see what I was attempting to do there is to ask him the question, can it happen? And he gave me the perfect answer. He said, oh, you got to be going 120 miles an hour in this crazy rollover situation that couldn't ever happen. This, that car wouldn't go 120 miles an hour. But at, we all agreed it was going way slower, 30 something miles an hour. And so because he painted a picture of this can only happen with a good working seatbelt in an obscene, crazy situation, we knew this wasn't. So the point was common sense tells us that if it can only normally happen in a uh, crazy situation, and this wasn't a crazy situation, then, then something had to have gone wrong. And, um, and so I pointed that out from the beginning that they agreed something that they agreed this shouldn't have happened. Um, I, a lot of times in, in closing, I talk about things like agreements. I won't go through what the agreements were in the case, but what I want to do is point the picture to the jury that this is not that hard. Your jury instructions are going to tell you a lot of elements. They're going to tell you a lot of things that you've got to decide, and a lot of them are agreed upon, especially in a product liability case. You'll get things like one of the things you got to prove is that the product was in substantially the same condition as when it was manufactured. That's something that you shouldn't have to fight about in trial in most cases. And so I usually inform the jury this was agreed upon. The, the us and the other side all aligned on um, on that issue so that it makes it easier and they can get to the and get to the uh, the things that are in dispute. But but I'll say this: it makes it appear as if 
you know, hey, there's a lot of things that are important here that, that we agree on and that they all are in my favor. Um, that's one reason I, I bring that up. Um, and, and so we had to prove that the seatbelt did, I told you they said it didn't even spool out, that it stayed in the position it should have been and that she was, um, that she was ejected even though it stayed locked up. And, and they tried to portray this as this just extremely uh, you know, crazy crash that was just rare and she was ejected despite the fact that she was correctly wearing the belt. And you can see how we prove it here in some of these photographs. Look at the photograph on the left. You'll see those two white marks and look at the black plastic. That's called a latch plate. There's two little kind of lumps in them. Little, those are called tangs. Those marks lined up exactly with the tang. Um, the tangs were, and those tangs were what was used to mark the belt as the belt went through the webbing. So the belt gets looser, it's, go, it's coming through the, the latch plate and those tangs mark it. Um, when you look at the other side of it, there's, a, one, there's another tang on that side. And here's the, here's the thing, it was a red mark. And so we were like, where did the red come from? How did it, how did it get red? Well, the, Ms. Bruner was wearing red. Her clothes got caught up in between the tang and the belt and put a red mark on the belt. And so we were able to measure those white marks. And by measuring those white marks, uh, we were able to show exactly how much of the, how, how loose the belt got. We could tell exactly. Um, they've defended it saying, look, there's all these other marks on the belt. And, and so the, it couldn't be that those marks that the plaintiffs are pointing to were as a result of it being loose, there's marks on different parts of the belt. And, um, and we showed that they were different or either they were a result of different parts where the belt went through. Um, you can see in the bottom left photograph there exactly how far it was at the 66, 60 and a half, 66 and a half inch mark where, the, uh, where it ended and it goes all the way down to in the, uh, in the 50s. So, you know, we had over a foot of webbing got loose in this seat belt system. Um, the, uh, you can see there's two lines, not one. The defense, the defense was adamant there was only one line because they had a hard time explaining two lines. Well, how could there be two lines uh, on this unless it was exactly what I said it was, those tangs that caused it? And so they tried really hard to argue with some, some creative pictures that they took. Um, and the angles that they took them, that there was only one line, but there was clearly two lines on the, on the belt when you took the photograph from the right angle. Um, and we showed them those, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. One of the things that we did, um, it, or one of the things they did, is they argued that these tangs would not leave a mark, but yet <clears throat> the, there was glass in the belt. The if there was glass in the belt, in the belt um, and on the tangs, which we found, then the glass would clearly uh, scratch the belt and mark it. And so we were able to find glass in the belt that we talked about. There was also marks on the, uh, on the belt, it's, I mean, the, the plastic itself. And we could find, um, we could see where there was, the webbing went through the seat belt retractor so fast that it melted the rub, the plastic on inside of the uh, latch plate there. And you can see those marks where the, uh, on the tang where it's, it's really clean um, at the top. And then there's a collection of, uh, there's a collection of plastic that gathered up at the bottom where the webbing went through. And so there was a lot of forensic work that went into this case to show that the seatbelt came unlatched. It, it shouldn't, this is something that I thought should have been clearly uh, agreed upon. I thought we had a lot of really good evidence to show that the belt um, unlatched, but they they never offered us a penny going into trial. We had a, we had no offers going into this trial, so they left us with no choice but to try this case. Um, this was something that I I, I really did um, was risky. In my closing argument, throughout the case, uh, I had showed the belt to the jury. I had gotten my expert to stand up and and show the belt. Really, I wanted to show the two marks, the, you know, the marks they say didn't exist. And so we were clearly 
always going up to the jury with the actual belt in our hand. We had taken it out of the vehicle and we would say, look, here it is. Here are the marks. Look at them. Turn them different directions and show them to them. They would always, they never did that. They never did that with their experts. They never came up with the belt and said, hey, there is no mark. So I challenged them um, in, in closing, who showed you the belt? And I took the belt in front of the jury and showed them again, the actual belt while I had this, um, while I had this slide up and I, you know, they had, I did this before they, you know, not in rebuttal, I did this first. And so they had an opportunity to come in and show them the belt again. I mean, almost it was a challenge to them. You've got to show the belt and they did it. They were afraid to show the belt. And, um, and so um, that was forensically a, a challenge to them. And so they, they, they avoided it by just not doing it. And I think that really hurt them. I think the jury saw me, you know, challenge them and, and give, them the, uh, give them the opportunity and they didn't take it. And so when I stood up in rebuttal, I really made a big deal about that then. Um, one of the things that they said that the, that the march on the belt were instead of being caused by those tangs was uh, that the, um, her body caused those marks, that they were uh, caused by the belt going across her body instead of going through the belt. And so I, I talked about why that wasn't the case and really how they had done nothing to prove that point. Uh, they just, it was just a, a really speculation on their part that they just threw out there without any proof, testing, scientific evidence at all. Um, another thing is uh, they, you know, uh, they didn't really dispute that a belt um, retractor can come unlocked, but that's kind of scary for all of us. And so I, I talked about in closing how they really admitted that it can happen, that this uh, and all the things that uh, made it possible to happen did happen in this crash. And I talked about how they admitted that. Again, I'm trying to give the jury ammunition to, to go back in the jury room and argue my case for me at that time. And I wanted the jury to say, they admit that I want to make it easy for them, easy for me to win. And so I, I, I reminded them of what their expert had said that, uh, that helped me a lot in the case. One of the big defenses in this case goes to the empty chair defense that I, I mentioned earlier. So as you recall, Jeep uh, made the Jeep Wrangler. They were not there. And so the defense was, look, this is not our fault. We just made the product that, that Jeep wanted. This was what they wanted that uh, we didn't have responsibility over the overall design of the of the retractor they gave us a they gave us the blueprints for what to build and and they didn't and that was it well what we did was through their own documents and testimony show not that that was not true at all that instead they actually were the designers of the belt Chrysler gave them some performance requirements which means we wanted to do this we wanted to do that but they didn't say how you should do that they didn't say, this is how you need to make it. This is not the, it wasn't so precise that they said this part needs to be used in this way and in this in this part of the retractor, but just it, it should, you know, like you're saying, okay, I want a car that goes, you know, 85 miles an hour and stops in X many seconds. And is so they had performance requirements, not design requirements. And so we were saying it was your design um, that really caused it to fail here in this crash. And we proved that through their own documents um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, I, I wanted to talk about when I was saying this, when I was putting the blame on the, the component part manufacturer, I had gotten them earlier in the case to agree with my theme in the case, um, which is if there's a safer way to build a belt system, you must choose the safer way. You, if, and, and again, I was they chose the way to build it. Only Chrysler chose the performance requirements, but the way they decided to meet those performance requirements was up to the component part manufacturer, key safety systems. And so, you know, that was my theme in the case. And I wanted to come back to that. I talked about it in opening. I talked about it throughout the case. And, um, and so I had brought it up. I brought it back into the case here at close. If there's a safer way, you must choose the safe, safer way. Well, they didn't choose the safer way. Um, and here's how. There was a uh, there was a component, and this was crazy. Uh, there was a component in the driver retra uh, retractor 
seatbelt system called a web sensor. What it does is it senses webbing coming through the retractor if it starts to come out fast and it stops the, the webbing from coming out. It's a redundant safety feature because it had the locking device that was on the passenger side. It, had the, it was the same exact retractor as the passenger side where the lady was ejected, Miss Bruner, but it had an, an extra safety system, a check. In case that fails, we've got this, the web sensor. Well, they didn't put that on the driver, on the passenger side. They had the, the extra safety system on the driver's side. They didn't have it on the passenger side. So you may ask yourself, why in the world would they do that? Why would they uh, put the extra safety system on the driver's side, but not the passenger side? And, and you know, ask yourself, how many people rode with you this work uh, to work this morning? How many people most days sit in your passenger seat? Uh, if you're like me and like most people, most days my passenger seat is empty. So statistically, statistically speaking, um, if my vehicle is in a wreck, I'm probably going to be alone. There's probably not going to be anybody seating in that seat. So, so they take the chance of saying, look, let's keep the safety, the expensive safety system out of the uh, vehicle and let's, uh, let's only put it where we probably are going to need it. Well, unfortunately, there was somebody sitting in the passenger seat when this crashed. Um, and so uh, then they argued, well, the web sensor wouldn't have done it, made a difference. Well, it, it did work for the driver. She had no injuries in this case. She was uninjured. She was in the exact same crash, the exact same rollover, sitting feet away from her mom, who was right beside her. Her mom gets killed because he's ejected. The daughter, who has the extra safety device, stays in the vehicle and lives. Um, we, they, they again argued that they weren't responsible throughout the case. That really was contradictory. Their lawyers said that. Their lawyers made the legal decision to make that argument. But uh, see what they're see what they're. Um, you agree that your company has a responsibility to provide a safe seatbelt system to the public, despite what. Chrysler may have asked for. Yes. So there again, we have got a, a, a opportunity to use the corporate representative deposition in the case to talk about um, a, a big issue uh, is that this is not Chrysler's fault. This is our fault. And I had gotten him to admit that I will take the, the you know, key safety systems responsibility is to provide safety to the occupants, not Chrysler. Uh, we have to sell a safe seatbelt. He had agreed with that, and it completely contradicted the position their lawyers took throughout the trial of the case. And so, um, so that way, therefore, we 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 threw it back at them. Um, you know, they had used bi biomechanically. We we addressed earlier how we addressed some of the issues uh, on the seatbelt that it came unlocked. Um, we address those by showing the belt itself, but biomechanically, we had, we we attacked it too. I mean, these cases are uh, highly forensic driven. Um, there's a lot of science in them, and here we attack the the biomechanical science of the of the belt by showing that um, that even there, you you shouldn't be ejected uh, with a tight belt, and we can prove by the by the evidence on um, Penny Bruner's body that she was ejected. And I, I won't get into the science of that as deep, but we, we did talk about she had this huge thigh injury. It, it, it's just kind of, I guess it's, I mean, it's just nasty. It filleted her thighs um, as if there was a knife that took her thighs off. And we showed that that could only occur if the belt got loose. Um, she, it had, she had to be thrown out with enough velocity and the only way she can get thrown out with enough velocity is if it's loose for her to, to that belt webbing to, to cause those fillet marks. And so um, we talked, we, we were able to show that. Um, and uh, I think that was effective with the jury. We, we then uh, moved to accident reconstruction where we attacked their accident reconstruction. They real, there was, there are certain scenario that allows a seatbelt to come unlatched. Uh, the, there's a ball inside there. Um, if the ball, if you slam on your brakes, physics says that the ball will go forward. 
towards the point of uh, that you are. And so it would you slam on your just like when you slam on your brakes, you you go forward. Uh, you keep going while the car is stopping. Well, same the ball does the same thing. If if you are if you run into a uh, or if you get hit from behind, um, the ball will go backwards. And it and that what at that any time that ball moves any direction, it locks the belt. It's called a ball and cup retractor. All our cars, most of our cars have ball and cup retractors. Today, most of our cars thankfully have also the and a redundant like the web sensor, and it keeps them from coming unlocked. But um, some still don't in, in seating positions other than the driver. But they needed to show that the that the that the situation did not exist, that the retractor, the ball and cut retractor, could the ball could ever go back to the neutral position. And so we showed that the actual rollover produced the um, the exact scenario where the ball could go back to the neutral position and then webbing could zzz come out. Well, they needed it to stay locked. And so they made it, they created an action reconstruction that was just wrong. But it, uh, they're under their action reconstruction, the, uh, the ball would always stay locked. Well, there was a couple of ways we found that they were wrong. One, you can see the path of the, um, the accident reconstruction through the median. Um, you can clearly see that the cars go in that direction through the median. Here's where they really messed up. There's a, you see that crepe myrtle in the left-hand picture. You can see our action reconstruction in the right. We clearly had the crepe myrtle hitting the bottom of the Jeep. That's where it happened. They didn't, they had it missing the bottom of the Jeep and they had this big model in the courtroom. I don't know how much money they spent on it with the action reconstruction. We had a diagram, it was not as fancy as theirs, but I was able to use that model during my close. Um, and I compared my picture where the crepe myrtle um, is you can see that green crepe myrtle there in the middle on the bottom of the Jeep. Um, and you can see the, where the crepe myrtle got knocked over. And here's the other thing. We found, pick, uh, we found pieces of the green uh, crepe myrtle on the bottom of the Jeep. We found leaves and, and bark um, in the Jeep, on the bottom of the Jeep. Well, they say it never happened, that it hit a different portion of the Jeep. Um, and, um, and, oh, and, and also they, they didn't have the, the crepe myrtle being damaged. So... Uh, which was crazy. That was just clearly knocked over in that picture. But we used that to uh, to attack them. It was very persuasive, and and so their scenario wasn't correct. Um, they had the wrong wheel hitting that mark right there. So the the uh, that moon shaped mark on the roadway would have been faced the other direction had it been the direction they said. They were clearly wrong about that. They called this. Uh, they called that. See my red circle on the bottom. They call that a sunshine mark. What they were claiming there was that that was not a mark caused by the crash in the roadway, that, you, that that was the sun shining through the wheel and leaving a sunshine mark on the roadway. Well, that clearly is a scratch. There's no way in the, you, you see other uh, marks on the, um, on the roadway that are not sunshine, that are sunshine, sun coming through, and that does not look like them. And so that was another way that we were able to uh, prove them wrong. We we really dismantled their case um, in a lot of different ways, and I'm you know I was really proud of the work that we did there, and our experts did an excellent job. Um, we've got uh, they claimed a crazy that our the Miss Bruner <clears throat> was thrown out much earlier, or excuse me, much later in the crash uh, than she was really thrown out. Uh, again, to show that the circumstances that allowed the belt to fail couldn't have occurred at that point. And they found a paper that um, talked about occupant trajectory in crashes. And they were really big on this paper, but the, the paper itself admitted that it had a huge error rate. Um, it only applied to vehicles with roofs. This was a Jeep without a roof. Um, it, it was just turn, it was just filled with flaws the paper itself and the paper admitted it um, and that was a paper they were relying on I thought it was weak to rely on that um, in light of the fact that the paper itself didn't didn't propose that it was per perfect um, this is where the case got emotional so we did bring in the the daughter the 15 year old daughter into the case I've done this long enough to know that um, that the 
car company, or in this case, the component part manufacturer is going to blame the driver of the crash. Whoever they believe caused the crash, that's who they blame. They want to put the blame on them for apportionment reasons. Um, and in this case, uh, they, uh, they didn't, you know, they didn't want to, they, they wanted to blame the dollar for the crash. They didn't want to blame Chrysler, which is interesting. They could have chosen to apportion damages to Chrysler for the Jeep, who would have been an empty chair. Again, they were immune bank for bankruptcy reasons. Uh, but because they didn't want to take the tactical reason of blaming the people they sell parts to, their, their customer, uh, and potentially putting all the fault on, on their customer, they chose not to. Instead, they said, well, I'm going to blame the 15-year-old daughter for this crash. And uh, in that situation, I thought that was, we had her there. And the way I explained that to the jury is, we wanted her there. We brought her in this case because we wanted her there to defend herself. We knew they were going to blame her, but um, we wanted her there with her own lawyers to defend herself. And she did a great job of doing that. But, but one of the saddest things in the case was I knew from, I never was able to talk to Amanda directly, but her, her dad was my client and her dad told me she blames herself for her mom's death. And, um, and so we, we knew that going into the trial that this verdict had the potential to either reinforce these negative emotions that she had about her mom's death or either to, to kind of take off the fault. Um, and in this case, um, she, it, it was a situation where she was able to, to re be removed from fault. She, I'll say this, she was assessed fault in this case. And this is another area where I feel like I'm, I may have made an error uh, in the case was she was given 20% fault in the case. Now, why? Not because the jury thought she did anything wrong. Matter of fact, talking to the jury afterwards, they, uh, they didn't want to give 20% fault. I suggested that to the jury, that it be 20% to uh, Amanda for driving it and 80% to Chrysler for, um, I mean, not Chrysler, key safety systems for the seatbelt system. And uh, they did exactly what I asked them to do. They went 80-20, but they didn't want to. Um, Amanda knew that. And Amanda called me. It's one of my proudest moments as a lawyer. Amanda called me after the crash and said, look, I have blamed myself. And she was out, excuse me, after the case was over, uh, she finally called me one day and she said, uh, look, I blame myself for what happened to my mom. Um, you know, I, I always thought that I killed my mom. And that jury, uh, you know, told me I did it. And so that gave her peace. And I was super proud of the work that we did to, to help her uh, find some, some peace for her with regard to what happened to her mom. That seatbelt did cause her to die. She was in the same crash that her mom was in. She was fine. Her seatbelt worked and she was protected. She may have caused the crash, but she didn't cause her mom's death. And, and the death was particularly difficult. Um, one of the things that, that happened on the scene of the roadway um, and we, we talked a lot about this throughout the trial, was there was a young teenage boy who came up on the wreck soon after that it happened. The mom was thrown out of the vehicle, and she laid on the roadway bleeding internally. She was bleeding to death, but she was still alert. She was still um, able to talk. And she said, look, um, she kept saying, but I was wearing my seatbelt, but I was wearing my seatbelt, but I was wearing my seatbelt. She lay there on the roadway dying, trying to figure out why am I laying on the roadway dying? Why am I in this roadway? Because I was wearing my seatbelt. And it goes back to that common sense dictate thing I talked about earlier. You shouldn't be thrown out of a car if you're wearing your seatbelt correctly. That's what it's there for. Um, um, you know, Penny Bruner, she knew that. She was confused why I'm, why I'm laying on the roadway when I was wearing my seatbelt. That had a big impact on the jury. Um, the fact and that little that young teenage boy came in to testify about that uh, at trial. Um, one of the things that I did in, in close in this case is I went through the jury instructions, not all of them, but the key ones. Um, I won't do that here, but but that's just a, a, something I think is useful. Um, go through, tell them why you win, show them, you know, be, be, don't be afraid. Uh, jury constructions are very uh, 
are very confusing there and there's a bunch of them and so be arm the jury with what they need to go back and and rule in your favor um, another thing i did is i I talked them through the jury verdict form. I, 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 those are confusing. I've had juries in the past get truly confused about how to fill it out and they filled it out wrong and they filled it out contrary to what they really wanted to do, um, and, which is extremely frustrating. Um, it's like, you you know, all they had to do was fill it out. So I go through and I tell them, this is exactly how you need to check mark it. This is, you know, I'll fill it out for them. Um, and then I'll, you know, even say date it right here and sign your name there. And then uh, finally, uh, you know, I did, I closed it with talking about what our damages are here in Georgia, full value of the life of Penny Brunner. And I talked about her life and, and her daughters and her family and what she enjoyed about life. And, and so that was, a, a, that was a really important case. It was one of the first cases in the country to find a verdict solely against a component part manufacturers, if not the first, I'm not, I'm, I'm sure it's not, but it, it's the first one I was aware of. And, and the reason was there was never a reason to sue only the component part manufacturer. Before that, you could always sue the car manufacturer. They had not ever declared bankruptcy. I mean, these are the, some of the largest corporations in the world, and they had um, always been powerful corporations. General Motors declared bankruptcy. Clark Chrysler declared bankruptcy. Uh, Ford did not, but uh, those two did, and they're, they were big, they're behemoths, and they had never done that, and so nobody had ever even envisioned a scenario where they might, and, um, they, but they did, and in this case, when they did, um, this left me having to do what nobody really had ever done before, is, is sue the component part manufacturer, make sure the blame all falls on them instead of the, uh, the instead of the company who sold the vehicle and made a lot of decisions and tested it too. They were the, they, you know, Chrysler tests their own vehicles. And so um, that was important. Um, and it was important, you know, victory, you know, today, lots of times we sue component part manufacturers, a lot of times just to get discovery. They have some documents, but, um, and they have some testing that they do. But at the end of the day, you know, maybe we don't even leave them in the case all the way to trial. Maybe we do. Uh, if it's an apportionment issue to, but it's a decision we make on a case by case basis, depending on, you know, lots of different factors and what role they had in the case. But um, in this one, I had to keep them in alone. And so uh, that was, that was really important. So you just kind of have to shift your strategy. Um, so anyway, I, I, that was the story of the Bruner case. Uh, kind of see a little bit how we put it together and how uh, the things that became important at trial and the things that became important, um, you know, at trial were lots of times things we knew were going to be important. And we addressed those in discovery. You could see how I used the corporate representative deposition um, uh, that was taken, you know, probably two years or a year and a half before we tried the case. Um, so anyway, I uh, thank you for, for being here this morning. I'd open it up for questions now. Does any, anybody has any questions? I'd love to uh, take a moment and answer those and see if we can, uh, um, provide any greater insight or if you've got any um, thoughts about strategy or, or, or the case itself, I'd love to answer those. Okay. We're not seeing any questions. We'll uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up today. Uh, again, I just love doing these. I'm, I'm every month. They're a pleasure. I love talking to you all um, as much as anything. I love hearing from you all afterwards. So please shoot me a, a an email, Chris Glover at BeasleyAllen.com, and I'd i love to uh, follow up with you or talk with you. Appreciate the opportunity to provide a CLE hour to you um, on these uh, on these valuable topics. Next month's going to be a great topic on negligent security. I'm going to have as my uh, guest, my good friend and uh, law partner, uh, Parker Miller. And Parker's going to do a great job. Let's see. Maybe we do have a question here. Um, let's see. All right. Thanks, Matt. Um, appreciate it. Uh, yeah. So, yes, we got Parker Miller's going to be talking next month about negligent security cases. And, and I get to kind of take a, a month off. I'll be there and, and kind of host him and let him uh, hold, the, hold the reins and get us through it. So anyway, thank you. I hope you all have a, a 
a great Thursday and rest of your week and an awesome weekend. Uh, take care.